Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If at any point you would like to jump forward to the next section of the video, there are chapter links down in the video timeline that allow you to jump forward or jump back. So this week I have a couple of tidbits to share. I'm going to answer a question that came up in my Ravelry group, and I'm going to share with you the progress that I have made upon returning to my vintage Roaring Twenties uh, sweater project. So let's get started. So the first tidbit I want to share is that the, the uh, presentation by Esther Rutter on her book, This Golden Fleece, which I told you about a couple of weeks ago, uh, she, it was one of these uh, York Festival of Ideas programs that uh, I was able to sign up and watch on Zoom a couple of weeks ago. Well, that program was recorded and is on their YouTube channel, but it's only available to watch until July 11th because Esther Rutter has other programs and presentations she's going to be doing this summer. So it's only going to be available to watch online for a couple of more weeks, but I'll leave a link down in the video description if, if you're interested in watching that. I thought, I found it really interesting. This, this is the woman who took a year to visit uh, various places in the UK uh, that had different knitting traditions and she knit items um, from each of those areas and explored the different varieties of wool breeds that are raised in different um, parts of the UK as well. So I was uh, asked a question in the past week on a video from a couple of months ago. And the question had to do with these tidbits that I share with you each week, uh, which tend to be things that show up in my uh, social media feed. And she wanted to know where I find, find out about these things. Um, and it, it could be something like an online museum exhibit, or it could be an article about something that's textile related, or it could be this an example of this this program that I was just telling you about um, by Esther Rutter, which was part of the York Festival of Ideas. So on Twitter, I uh, follow, there's a couple of like knitters or knit designers that I follow and they will retweet other designers or other knitters or other textile related things. And it was through that small group of people that I was following that I started seeing a woman named Dr. Kate Strassen. She's a fashion historian in the UK. And so somebody was retweeting her tweets fairly often and she tends to post like a beautiful garment from some period in time. Just about every day she'll post some, some photo and talk a little bit about it. And so I really, I, those would show up in my feed every so often. So I finally decided to just follow her. Well, then she follows other fashion historians. So pretty soon I started collecting other fashion historians from the UK and they're from different universities and they tend to retweet or tweet about these various textile related museum events and, and so on. So that's how I tend to find out about these things. And after a while, if you're just following people that you see in these retweets, you start to see that you're in this little bubble. Everybody's just retweeting each other. So another thing that I have done is uh, I'll just go look and see who those people follow because they may not retweet uh, other people every single time, but they still may be following interesting people. So I found people who are historians in other areas. So then I look and see, well, they're retweeting something that's really interesting, but the the person or the institution that they're, that they're retweeting, is that something that I would be interested in following on a daily basis as well. So that's how I collect things. And I just look to see what's showing up in my feed each week and I take a note of it um, to share with you. So a couple of weeks ago, I was a guest on Suzanne Bryan's, uh, who's known as Knitting Suzanne, I was a, a guest on her live stream um, channel, Off the Cuff. And we're both master hand knitters, so we had, were talking a little bit about that. And I get asked every so often about the master hand knitting program. And somebody in the past week or so said, oh, they, they were trying to get the nerve up to start the master hand knitting program. 
And uh, so I just wanted to make you guys aware that the Master Hand Knitting Program is a correspondence course that's put on by TKGA, which is the Knitting Guild Association. And that was an, that was an organization, it's a nonprofit organization that was founded in the mid 1980s for the purpose of educating knitters. Like that's the whole reason the organization exists. And the very first program that they started was the Master Hand Knitting Program. And it has evolved in the 35 years um, since it's first started. And it's much larger and more complex than it was at the beginning. But the idea was you know, to, to develop a, a standard that of of knowledge that somebody who called themselves a master hand knitter would have, and it would include the ability to write about it, to to um, to design, to display your knitting ability, all of anything that had to do with knitting is covered by the master hand knitting program. But it's not a course, it's not a class. They don't give you a curriculum then that, that they then teach toward and then test you on. Instead, they give you a, a list of things they expect you to master and they want you to demonstrate your mastery of it and they give you lists of resources and reference materials that you can use to, to uh, research all of these things that you may not know because you have to give references well this kind of a program can be really intimidating like when I started it I did not intend to become a master hand knitter I did not intend to do all three levels of the program I just wanted to be a better knitter when I finished level one, I knew that I wanted to go through the, I wanted to complete the entire thing. And, but I, but I didn't set out that way. And many people, even after they've done level one or when they're partway through level one are like, I, this is not what I want. I just want to be a better knitter. Well, the Knitting Guild Association, although it started with the Master Hand Knitting Program, they have many, many programs and classes. So they do offer actual classes that have a curriculum that you're assigned a teacher, that you get feedback and it's more of a give and take. It's not a show us what you know, yes, 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 no, do that one again. It, it's a very different type of thing where you're actually taking a class. So one of the classes that they offer is called Basics, Basics, Basics. Uh, and it just makes sure that you've got things like your tension and your gauge and you really understand what particular stitch patterns are and and you learn from that you're not but you're not you know uh, judged like this passes this fails it's just a conversation that you have with the teacher they have other programs on finishing techniques but they have a program that they that came out in the past year or so that's called I think it's called the professional knitting or professional knitters program and that one is specifically for people who just want to become really excellent knitters they don't want to design or write patterns they don't want to write articles um, they don't want to write books they don't want to do any of that other stuff they just want to be really really good knitters and the idea behind that program was that professional knitters, knitters who do like say sample knitting, um, there's no standard for those people. They may say that they're excellent knitters and then they submit the sample and if they aren't really that good after all. So it's a way to sort of set some standards and to make sure that you can meet those, those standards in your own knitting. So that doesn't mean you have to become a professional knitter, but any of these courses uh, might be really beneficial to you or might be really appealing to you, uh, depending on what it is that you're looking to do in order to improve your knitting. So there's lots and lots of things you can do besides the Master Hand Knitting Program um, that, that is probably going to be more appealing to the majority of knitters because it really does take a, a really kind of almost peculiar type of personality to, uh, get through the master hand knitting program. Um, it's very analytical and you do have to, if not enjoy writing, be willing to write. And because there is a lot of writing involved as well. And that is not necessarily what people have in mind when they say they want to become a better knitter. I will leave links to uh, the Knitting Guild Association down in the uh, video description and you can go there and see what their educational programs are. So in my Ravelry group, there is a discussion thread that's called something like Ask Me Anything for Casual Fridays. And it's, it's a place where you can ask questions about topics that might be uh, good for just sort of 
general discussion rather than teaching a very specific um, technique. And a question that came up, I think it was today or yesterday, this uh, person wanted to know what the, the reason is for setup rows. She didn't really understand what the, the purpose of setup rows uh, were for. So I thought I'd talk about that. Setup rows are typically used uh, in a, as a way of transitioning from one type of stitch pattern to another. Um, it's not always, sometimes you might do a setup row immediately after casting on, but that's a transition from the, the loops on the needle to the way you want to set up um, the stitch pattern going forward. That transition row uh, might look very much like an, a regular row in the stitch pattern that, you, that you're going to be working, or it might include um, some increases or it might include decreases. So if you're transitioning, let's say from ribbing to some other stitch pattern, maybe the new stitch pattern is cables and you're going to need a lot more um, stitches than you were using in the rib ribbing area. So you're going to have to do some increases. And with something like cables, those increases are going to appear in the columns where the cables are going to appear because that's where the gauge changes. Those stitches, because they're crossing over each other, are causing um, the stitches to pull in and you need more stitches to uh, span across the same linear measurement. So maybe you only needed five stitches per inch before you're going to do the cables, but the cables are crossing enough so that you're going to have seven stitches per inch when you're cabling. So those two extra stitches that you need in that one inch of fabric are going to appear at the base of the cable. You're only going to do that one time. You only need to increase to get that number of extra stitches you need that one time. And the other thing that you're going to be doing in a cable environment is you're going to have columns of knits and columns of purls and it's not necessarily going to be the same division of knits and purls that you had in the ribbing. So you need to just make that transition from say knit two purl to knit two purl to knit two purl two to something like knit six purl two knit six purl two something like that. And so you're establishing that first row where you're just establishing what the knit columns are and what the purl columns are before you start doing any of the actual cable crossings. And you also want to make sure that you've increased to the number of stitches that you need in order to work those cable columns. So for lace patterns, if you're knitting flat, oftentimes you're doing a right side row where you've got yarn overs and decreases, and then the wrong side rows, you're just purling completely across. So a pattern repeat is going to be an even number of rows. You might have eight rows, you might have 10 rows, and every other row in that repeat is going to be just a plain purl row. Well, before you start your pattern repeat, you might want to establish just that plain purl row. You're going to do a plain wrong side a row. Maybe you not, might need to do an increase or decrease to get the stitch count correct. And that might be another reason thing that you're doing in that setup row. And then from that on, you're going to work the eight or 10 row repeat that the lace has where you're working, uh, the purl rows are always a wrong side. And usually with lace, the last row that you work is going to be a purl row because you're not just going to end with yarn overs and decreases, you're going to end with a purl row. So because you are starting with a purl row and ending with a purl row, one of those rows is not going to be included in the repeat. And typically it's that one at the very beginning. Another reason for working a setup row is that, so let's say you are working your ribbing on smaller needles. And so you have worked, say, 10 rows of ribbing and you've used the smaller needles. And now you need to switch to the larger needles. And you're going to switch to a bigger needle and you're going to work a, like a wrong side setup row. Uh, sometimes you might have more than one setup row, but for various reasons, but you're going to do a wrong side setup row and you're going to be doing it using that larger needle. But the stitches that are coming off the needle are still going to be small. They were formed with that smaller needle. And this way, when you work your setup row, you are creating stitches that on the needle that are the, the, the size that you want them to be when you work the actual next 
stitch pattern. So that's another reason um, to do a setup row. Sometimes you don't have just one setup row, but you might have two setup rows. And to understand why that would be, you just really need to look at the pattern if there's a chart or look at the instructions. And you can see what's being done in each of those setup rows that literally sets you up for doing what comes next. So again, setup rows are just a way to transition from something that you have been doing to the next thing. So it's just something to get you ready uh, and prepared to transition into that next step. Okay, so you probably have noticed this sitting right here. Um, this is my Roaring Twenties vintage sweater that I started working on in January. And in early March, I was working on the crocheted bits. So most of this sweater is knit. Everything you see here is knit, but the finishing details are crocheted. And those details are the um, wristband for the bottom of the sleeves. Uh, and then there's these little crocheted squares that are all attached together of different colors that, that frame um, the neckline to become the collar. So I've talked about this many times that I tend to have a tolerance limit for how long I can work on a specific project and only that project uh, without taking a break from it. And so this project I started working on probably the first week of January. And a lot of that was, was um, thinking work and planning work because I knew I was going to have to make modifications for this. So it was planning on how I was going to do that and figuring out what yarn I was going to use and what the gauge was and, and uh, where and how I was going to need to modify it. And some of the modifications, I kind of knew what I was, I had an idea of what I was going to have to do, but I didn't know how I was going to actually do that. So I worked on this pretty steadily until end of February, beginning of March. And then when I was working on the crochet parts and I just was a little tired of it. And then they had the stay at home orders and nobody knew what the future was holding. It was really hard. And I just put it to the side and I was working on a series of smaller projects like uh, hats and socks and things like that. So um, I, I chose this, or I started working on this as part of a knit along in the All Things Vintage group on Ravelry. I had been looking at this particular 1920s pattern for months. It had caught my eye the first time I saw it, um, but there were a lot of things that were keeping me from doing it. And, and part of that was the crocheted bits. I'm not really a crocheter. I'm better at crocheting now. I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of practice and preparation for the collar and the sleeves, but that kind of put me off a little bit. Um, but it was this Roaring Twenties uh, knit along that the All Things Vintage group announced the beginning of January. I thought, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to go for it. And so I went gangbusters on it for about two and a half months. And um, it's almost the end of June. So the knit along ends on June 30th. I don't know if I'll actually get this done by June 30th. I think there's a good good chance that I can. It's hard for me to gauge because of if there's so much crochet that I have to do. And then the other reason is that I was asked to do a uh, program in, for, in July for a, a knitter skilled out in Oregon. So it'd be by Zoom. And we decided the topic would be on um, my exploration of uh, vintage knitting. And so I really want to get this done before that program. It just as a refresher on how this sweater is constructed, I'm gonna do some overhead to explain uh, uh, how this was constructed. Like it was all knit in one big piece, flat, starting at the bottom of the back, um, coming up over the shoulders and down the front. And so when I got to the sleeves, you had to cast on a bunch of stitches. And so I was knitting the sleeves at the same time that I was knitting the shoulders. And then I came down the front um, after that was done. So one of the challenges in making modifications for this sweater was that there's this very horizontal pattern with a very specific numbers of rows uh, to create each of these sort of motif stripes. And so by, in order to add length, I would need to add, 
you know, uh, one of these little plain stripes plus a motif stripe in order to add extra length. And that would only add extra length up to the underarm. And because this sleeve was all worked in one piece, I couldn't just add length to the upper part without it affecting the circumference of the sleeve. And the sleeve is all the same circumference um, for the entire length. And then um, there are these slashes at the ends of the sleeves that create these openings that cause this to blouse out at the bottom. And so if I were to if I were to increase the width of the sleeve at the at the upper part, that would increase it at the bottom as well. And so I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do that. And I and I kind of thought and thought about it and I realized I needed to put in um, some triangular gussets in the underarm. And I, but I wasn't really sure how I was going to do that. So I came up with a plan and I executed it yesterday and I think it, it works. I did try it on and it fits. I did it, I, I did it for one sleeve and it's almost done for the other. It's so gonna do the overhead and kind of show you what I did. I'm gonna show you what uh, underarm gussets normally look like in a regular sweater and then what I had to do in this sweater because just the construction process is so different from any other um, sweater where you'd normally use uh, gussets like this. So here is how the sweater looked when it was when I was done with the knitting before I ever did any seaming or anything like that. So this is the back of the sweater. So you, you start back here, you knit up in this direction and the instructions tell you to cast on um, a bunch of stitches and then you work across, cast on a bunch more. And then every however many rows, you're binding off stitches and you bind off stitches and you cast on stitches. So you're creating these um, slits. I may have, do I have the right number on each side? And then you're supposed to bind them off and at the same time you're doing all of this, you bind off for the neck and you're doing the next shaping. So you get up to here and at this point everything is on the needles all at one time. After you bind off for the neck then you're just working half of it right here until you get down to the base of the V and then you come back and you finish uh, this one up and then you are working um, this way all the way down. So when you are sewing this up, you have to sew the, the side of the front and the side of the back together and then you have to sew up the sleeves together. But the problem was this was going to be too tight for me. I needed more room here and I wasn't sure how much room I needed. So my solution was that I wanted to uh, create um, kind of some room in the underarm here by using uh, underarm gussets. And that would create more room in the underarm right here without changing the circumference of the sleeve everywhere else. This is a sweater I knit a few years ago that has a, got the, the, a gusset, a triangular gusset in the underarm done in a pretty traditional way. So this is a sweater where um, it's a cardigan. And so I knit it all in one piece. Uh, all the way up until I got to a few inches from the underarm and then I started doing increases right here. So I created this kind of triangular shape right here at the underarm. So it's just giving a room at that underarm area that allows the rest of the, the body to be a little bit more fitted but it gives you more room at that underarm. So here is that gusset from the side and this is where uh, the underarm ends right here. So all of these stitches that I had used for this gusset, they just got put on waste yarn. And from then on, I just knit the front straight up and the back straight up in, in separate pieces in order to create the opening for the sleeve. Well then, in order to knit the sleeve, I put those live stitches back on the needles. I picked up stitches around the edge and then I worked the sleeve top down. And as I worked the sleeve 
I had these underarm stitches right here, I created the other half, uh, I created another triangle. So I'm, it's really a diamond shape. The half of the diamond is on the body and half of the diamond is on the sleeve. And in this case, it was, um, in, it was the same shape. It was the, the same uh, length and width for the body as it was for the sleeve because you were, you were knitting this gusset at the same time in the same direction. So, so everything here was knit this way, everything here was knit this way, it all worked out. This sweater is a different story because you're knitting just the front coming up to the arm, underarm and then you have to cast on all of those stitches. So everything is getting knit in this direction. So if I were to try to add a gusset while I was just knitting the front, um, then I would have had to do it, then I would have had to try to figure out how to add that here in um, the sleeve part here that was being knit in this direction, not in that direction. And then I would have had to mirror that when I came down in this direction. So I wasn't sure how much room I needed and if I misjudged in anywhere on here, by the time in order to fix it, I would have had to rip everything back out. So what I did was I just knit these, the sides straight, just as um, the instructions called for. But instead of doing a regular cast on for the sleeves, I did a provisional cast on so that I would have live stitches at the base here. And then when I finished the sleeve on this side, I just put all of those stitches on waist yarn so that they were, they were also live stitches. So then when, so the first thing I then did was to sew up um, the sides. And remember, the back was knit in this direction and the front was knit in this direction. So if I wanted to use mattress stitch, normally if both of the pieces of fabric are knit in the same direction, you can either seam a full stitch from each side. And so you have, a, you have one stitch, the full edge stitches on the inside of the fabric when you sew the pieces together, or you just take a half a stitch from each side and so then you have a half a stitch at the edge and a half a stitch at this edge and it forms what looks like a full stitch along that actual seam line. But I couldn't do that because the orientation of the stitches was, were different. The ones on this half of the fabric were like this and the ones on that half were like this. So if I took a full stitch in, it would have this weird look at the edge. So what I did was I used half a stitch from one side of the fabric and a full stitch from the other. And that way I got a seam, so come up close. So the seam is right here. I can feel it under here. So it's between these two stitches. So one of these um, I took it is really a half a stitch and the other one is a full stitch. This little black uh, bump here is because I was knitting in this direction and somehow the black yarn tail got wrapped around a stitch there and I'm gonna to have to cover it up in some way. There's uh, no way to get rid of that. It just is showing up right there. So, uh, so the first thing I had to do was seam up the sides and I decided to stop when I got to this stripe. It just seemed like, well, that would give me, you know, a couple of inches of room um, to add a gusset. And I put my live stitches from the sleeves on circular. So I had a long circular for the, the provisional cast on live stitches and, um, and another circular needle for the others. And then I could try this on and kind of see how much room did I actually need in the underarm. And I decided I needed a couple of inches. So when you are working this direction, so I, I needed two, two inches, which in rows was about 14 rows, um, but two inches on fabric that's um, being knit this way is about 10 stitches because we're talking about rows, two inches of rows and two inches of stitches. So I couldn't do the two triangles um, the same way. So I tried the sleeve on and I decided I wanted to add more room all the way down to the elbow and I would just use short row shaping. And I don't think this is the, pr the prettiest result, but it works, it's functional. If I were going to plan it 
Again, I might do something slightly different, um, but, but this works. So what I did was I started at this edge with black yarn. I worked a full row of black all the way uh, across all of the stitches. Then I turned and I purled until I got down to this point right here. Then I just left that black yarn hanging. I didn't cut it, I just left it there. Then I returned back to this edge and I joined this buttercream color and I worked about 12 stitches. I turned it a short row turn, went back. Then I worked 24 stitches at a short row turn, came back. Then I went all the way to 36 stitches right here, did a short row turn, came back, did 24, came back, did 12, came back. And then I cut that buttercream yarn. So I'd added this wedge of buttercream in there. Um, and so far I had one black row going all the way across and the second black row coming down to here and the yarn was hanging there. So I went back to that location because I'm working on circular needles, I can start at either end. And I went uh, up, I, I knit across all of these stitches here to create the first, uh, to create one row of black on this edge right here. And then I grafted using the black yarn. I grafted the single black row I had with the buttercream live stitches that I had over here. And by grafting all the way across, I created a second row of black stitches um, all, that went all the way down. So that's how I inserted this. So this is about two inches wide uh, from here to here. And I, I made it kind of long so it went down to my elbow because this is a kind of a fitted sleeve. So then I had to fill in this hole that I have here where I hadn't done the seaming. I'd stopped my seaming at that black stripe. And so I picked up a, a couple of inches worth of stitches plus a couple extra. Um, two inches would be 10 stitches, but I needed extra stitches to be taken in in the seam. And I wanted an odd number because I wanted to end with a single stitch. So I picked up 13 stitches along the edge here. And then about every four rows, I decreased two stitches, one at each edge. I, I decreased one stitch in from the edge. And then when I had five stitches left, I did a central double decrease, which left me with three altogether. Then I worked a row and bound off. So, um, so that is the shape. Um, to fit in here. And I, I haven't sewn this one in yet. But I, and I mostly sewed this one in. So this gives me this, this is a, a shorter triangle than I have on the sleeve. Um, but it's, it's the same width right here. So I did try it on and it did work. So I, you know, I tried it on at different stages. I, I, I made sure I, I knew how many inches I needed for the sleeve so I knew, would know how wide the short rows needed to be there. When I, when I got that done, I tried it on. It felt like it worked. Um, I checked and, and to look to see if this was going to work here. This was very quick to knit um, and it, it worked, looked like it was going to uh, fit. So I sewed it in, tried it on, it fit. Um, and then if it hadn't fit, I could have unsewn it. I could have uh, made this uh, seam longer or shorter, made this triangle a different shape if I needed to. So, uh, so that's how I am dealing with uh, the gussets. So what I have left in this sweater now is to outline the slashes with crochet uh, and attach the bottoms of the sleeves to those uh, wristbands and that will complete the sleeves. Uh, and then I have to do those squares. I had done uh, squares originally before I put things to the side and I didn't like the way the outline was, was going. The squares are each supposed to be uh, outlined with a row of black and then a row of this buttercream color and I didn't like the way it looked and so I'd been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to get the best looking result and I figured out how to do that but it was going to require recrocheting all of the squares. So, um, so that's what I'm going to be doing next is everything's uh, from here on out is crochet and then there's um, quite a bit of 
ends to weave in still. I did a lot of end weaving in the past couple of days, um, but I still have some more. And, uh, but so hopefully I can get that done this week and this will be done uh, for next week. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.